Hi all. So in this video, we're going to see about examination of cranial nerves 8 to 12. So this video is especially for those first year MBBS students who are going to appear for their clinical practical physiology examination. So we know that we've got 12 cranial nerves. We've already seen how to examine cranial nerve 1 to 6. We've done a separate video on uh, examination of facial nerve. And now in this video, we're going to see how to examine cranial nerves 8 to 12. So cranial nerve 8 is the vestibular cochlear nerve, so which has got a vestibular part and a cochlear part. So to test the vestibular part, you can ask the subject whether he's got any vertigo because vestibular system is concerned with equilibrium. So if there is a lesion with the vestibular part, the person will manifest with symptoms like vertigo. You can also look for nystagmus. So vertigo and nystagmus are used to test the vestibular part. Now moving on to the cochlear part which is very important. We know that cochlea is concerned with hearing. So to test the cochlear part means we are going to test the hearing. To test the hearing we have got a tuning fork test. So this is a tuning fork as you can see we have got certain parts for the tuning fork. These are the prongs, these are the stem, this is the stem and this is the base. So we've got tuning forks of different frequencies are available for doing this test for hearing. We especially use tuning fork of frequency 256 or 512. Remember higher frequency tuning forks are used for hearing 256 or 512. And the basic function of these tuning fork tests is to identify whether there's any conductive deafness or sensory neural deafness. What conductive and sensory neural deafness is we'll see in a short while. Before that, we'll just see some, some precautions to be taken while doing these tuning fork tests. So first of all, how do you identify which frequency is used? So for that, you just have to zoom in and look at the stem of the tuning fork. There, the frequency will most probably be engraved. So always remember to take 256 or 512 for Rennie and Weber's test. Secondly, you have to hold the tuning fork like this. You have to hold it at the stem of the tuning fork. Never touch your fingers on the prongs because that will dampen the vibration of the prongs. So just hold at the stem. And how do we activate the prongs to make the tuning fork vibrate? You can either strike on the hypothena remnants, your own hypothena remnants or your elbow. That is the olecranon process. So from an examination point of view, it is not uh, suggested that you strike it on any other surface like the examiner's table or anything. You can use either hypothena remnants or the olecranon process which is the most comfortable points to strike or make the tuning fork vibrate. Okay, so I hope you'll remember these points during the examination. Now moving on to what we said before. What is meant by conductive deafness and what is meant by sensory neural deafness? So for that we should know how the basics of hearing. So hearing can be of two types. One is air conduction, which is our normal route by which we hear things. So uh, air travels through the external auditory meatus, reaches the tympanic membrane, vibrates the ossicles and reaches the cochlea. That is meant by air conduction. Now there is something called bone conduction also. Through the bones, the waves get traveled and reaches the cochlea. So that is bone conduction. Normally, air conduction is better than bone conduction. Okay. Now, what is meant by conductive deafness? So, in conductive deaf deafness, the conductive pathway is affected, which means the, the, the sound that travels through this pathway, through the external auditory meatus or the ossicles, that is affected. But the cochlea is normal or the inner ear is normal. So, here in this case, the person will have decreased hearing because this pathway is affected. So what is sensory neural deafness? In sensory neural deafness, the pathway is normal but the inner ear or the cochlea is affected. So that is meant by sensory neural hearing loss. So hearing loss can be of two types. Conductive means the conductive pathway is affected. Sensory neural means the inner ear or the cochlea itself is affected. So moving on to the test for hearing. So basically we have got two tests. One is called Weber's test. So how do we do the Weber's test? So basically, we have to first, before doing this test, we have to explain and demonstrate what we are going to do. See, the subjects might be seeing the tuning fork for the first time. 
so we have to reassure them that it's not painful and we have to show them you have to vibrate the tuning fork keep it on a body permanence and tell that this is a sensation that you're going to feel when i keep this on your body so explain the procedure demonstrate what you're going to do and then start the procedure so for this weber's test you can you can place the base of a vibrating tuning fork on the middle of the vorte vertex of forehead so something like this you can keep it on the vertex or the forehead because the uh, vertex will be covered with hair we usually keep it on the forehead and then you ask to which ear is the sound better heard okay so basically we want to know whether it is heard equally on both ears but we don't want to ask a leading question so you ask to which ear is the sound better heard so normally the sound should be heard equally on both sides that means the weber should be centralized that is a term used for that the weber should be centralized now if it is heard more towards one side then we say the weber is lateralized which means the sound is heard better on one side so we'll uh, try to explain that concept so suppose this is the skull you've got the right and the left side and we've got the ear showing the conductive pathway and the cochlea so normally when you keep a toning fork on the vertex or the forehead what happens through bone conduction the information will reach the cochlea and we'll be will be able to hear the sound on both sides equally right now suppose we've got a conductive hearing loss on one side i hope you remember what conductive hearing loss is so here in this case the pathway is affected so now tell me what will happen to the sound see in this case the person will hear better on the on the on the part where we they have the conductive hearing loss why that is because since there is no background noise okay this ear will get this bone conduction better because the normal masking usually because of the background sound there be some masking of the sound now that is not occurring here because there is a conductive hearing loss so in this case the sound or the weber's vibration will be better heard on that ear which has got the conducting deafness okay so this is one scenario where the weber can be lateralized to the right side another scenario is that where the weber can be uh, lateralized to the right side is a sensory neural hearing loss on the left side so see sensory neural hearing loss means the cochlea is affected or the nerve is affected so here in this case this cochlea or the nerve is affected here also the person will hear better on the opposite ear whereas he will hear only small sound on this affected side why is it so because here obviously the cochlea and the nerve is affected so even if the bone is conducting it it will not reach the person will not be able to hear because on this part the cochlea is affected so here also the weber will be lateralized to the right side so if the person says that the weber is heard more on one side it means that either the person has a conductive hearing loss on that side or the person has a sensory neural hearing loss on the opposite side okay so this is a concept regarding weber's test uh, please try to uh, ponder on this point for some time so that you can actually understand what is said okay so uh, lateralized means sound is better heard on one side which means there could be a conductive deafness on that side or sensory neural deafness on the opposite side so this is the basics of weber's test next is the rinne's test so how do we do the rinne's test here also you have to explain the procedure first to the subject demonstrate it and then start doing so for to do the rinne's test we first place the base of the tuning fork of the vibrating tuning fork or the mastoid process where is the mastoid process we know it is behind the ear so we keep the base remember it is a base of the tuning fork they are we keeping on the mastoid process and then we instruct the subject to signal when they start and stop hearing the sound so remember once or twice before actually doing the test you have to vibrate the tuning fork and keep it on their mastoid process and tell them see this is what you are going to feel are you feeling anything you have to re- make make them understand what you want to do okay so keep the base of the tuning fork on the mastoid process and tell them when you stop hearing the sound raise your hands okay so Uh, you keep keep it there and uh, as a subject to raise a hand whenever they stop hearing the sound as soon as they stop hearing the sound 
bring the tuning fork to the front of the ear okay do not strike it again just like that bring it to the front of the ear and ask them if they are hearing anything now in this case the person if their ears are normal they will be able to hear it better why because air conduction is better than bone conduction so initially when we kept on the mastered process we were testing their bone conduction okay now when even if the bone conduction fades off if we keep it in front of the ear if the, the person should be able to hear because air conduction is always better than bone conduction normally now one thing we have to remember here is when you keep the tuning fork in front of the ear make sure you keep it like this that means the prongs should be like this sideways not like this i've seen students keeping like this if you keep it like this obviously they might they might not hear because the sound waves are going on either side we want to keep it tilted at 90 degree that means it is it should be parallel to that ear canal so that the waves can go to the ear so this is how you have to hold the tuning fork in front of the ear okay practice this among yourselves so that uh, the concept will be clear okay so and remember you have to do it on both the sides do do not uh, stop after doing it on one side you have to do it on both the side repeat on both the sides so normally the subject will still hear the sound which means rinne is positive remember rinne positive is the normal air conduction is better than bone conduction okay now if the person is not hearing it means that bone conduction is better than air conduction or that means there is a conductive hearing loss so we'll just explain uh, that concept once more see initially we did a weber's test and we said that it was suppose it was left glass to the right we said there are two options either it could be a conductive hearing loss on the same side or sensory neural hearing loss on the opposite side okay now we are doing a rinne's test okay so in rinne's test when we do a rinne's test we can know for sure whether it is the air conduction or bone conduction that is better so suppose in this person itself whom we got weber lateralized to the right when we do a rinne's test and see that if he's got a bone conduction better than air conduction on the right side we can say that for sure that there is conductive hearing loss on the right side now suppose it is normal here we can say that it must be a sensory neural hearing loss on the other side so that is why we have two test for hearing one weber and other rinne because in by weber you cannot actually pinpoint what the cause is so that is why we first do weber find out where the problem is and then we do rinne to at pinpoint what the cause is okay so this is the concept of rinne and weber next nerve is the glossopharyngeal nerve the ninth cranial nerve is a glossopharyngeal nerve so to test that we've got Uh, to test the taste sensation on the posterior one third, anterior two third was by the facial nerve, so posterior one third is by the glossopharyngeal nerve. You can also do the pharyngeal reflex or the gag reflex to test for the glossopharyngeal nerve. So usually it is uh, from an exam point of view it is not that important because usually we do not ask the students to do that because it will be uncomfortable for the subject. Next we have the vagus nerve. So to test the vagus nerve, we basically ask some questions. We ask whether there is any nasal regurgitation of fluids during swallowing, when the person is having water or any fluids, whether there is fluid coming out of the nose, whether there is any. We test whether there is any nasal twang of the voice, and we also look for any deviation of the uvula. So you know this is the uvula. We look whether it's deviated to either side, and we also ask him to say ah. So why are we asking him to say ah? Because we want to make sure whether both sides of the palatal arch, which means these palatal arches, we want to know whether it is moving up together during phonation. So we ask him to say ah and observe the movement of the palatal arches. Okay, so that is how we'll test the vagus nerve. Then we have to test the spinal accessory nerve. So spinal accessory nerve basically we are going to test two uh, muscles. First one is the trapezius. So for that we the examiner will stand behind the subject and ask him to shrug the shoulders against resistance and the other muscle which is supplied by the spinal axillary nerve is the sternocleidomastoid so for that we ask the subject to turn the head to one side okay turn the head to one side while we apply resistance in the opposite direction in that case you can actually see the sternocleidomastoid becoming taut so as shown in this figure this sternocleidomastoid will be taut when we apply resistance And finally, the twelfth cranial nerve, which is the hypoglossal. 
so we know that the term glossal always refers to tongue so here also we have to examine the tongue so we ask the subject to protrude the tongue and we look for any deviation of the tongue so here obviously you can see that there is a deviation of the tongue okay and then you check for any wasting wasting means you can see that that part of the tongue muscle the muscles of the tongue will be uh, lesser or there will be uh, it will be of decreased size when compared to the normal so here as you can see there is slight wasting on this side when compared to the normal you also have to check for any tremor whether there is any tremor of the tongue and then you have to check for the strength of the tongue muscle how do you assess the strength of the tongue muscle you can ask the subject to press over the cheek while you apply resistance okay and then you check for any fasciculation remember you have to test the fasciculation with the tongue inside the mouth okay so that will complete the hypoglossal nerve so to summarize we've seen how to examine the first six cranial nerves the facial nerve and the vestibular cochlea glossopharyngeal vagus spinal accessory and hypoglossal so i hope this concept is clear thank you